Well, we're in our series that uh, we're doing a journey through the book of James. And um, this week, week two, we're going to talk about living out faith, the fruit of true belief. And one of the things I'm going to do, I, I don't usually put something in the message like this recently, but there's a song that goes along with this very theme. And uh, it's by an artist named Phil Keggy. Um, If you don't know who Phil is, he's out of the Jesus movement era, okay? And there's a lot of talk that um, he, and a lot of mainstream secular guitar guitarists have referred to him as one of the best guitarists, okay? Think of some of your finest secular guitarists, and they're pointing to him as the guy. And this guy's even missing a finger. He lost when he was four years old. So he did a song that I want to end with today, my message. And um, he's a virtuoso. God's given him talent. He had he was in a band before he got saved called Glass Harp and uh, is actually in the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame. But uh, I've seen him many times and has a heart for God. And um, he ends with this, and he does some trickery on his guitar to make it sound like a full band. You'll appreciate it. But I want you to listen to the message of his song as well. But um, we're going to dive in on the, the teachings, I would argue powerful teachings, found in the book of James. Um, and in this book specifically, it focuses on chapter 2. It challenges us to examine the way we live out our faith, all right? And reminds us that true belief should be produced, should produce visible fruit in our lives. You know, from youth group up, people will say, how do you know they're a Christian? Well, you know, the go-to scripture in the Bible is you'll know a tree by its fruits. All right? So when somebody sees you or me functioning outside of the church setting, okay, let me back up. Out of the building setting, you're the church, okay? When they see us functioning out of the building beyond Sundays, that's how people know you're a Christian, by the fruit you bear. Um, we all have our different ways of doing it. We reflect it in our jobs. We should be reflecting it first and foremost at home. That's where ministry starts. Um, we reflect it in how we get involved in community things. Um, I look at my own life, and this next meeting will start my second term on the school board for Wapaka. It's my way. I've, I'm, I have a vested interest in this. I have three kids in school, and by being uh, a Christian on the school board, it's my way of having input into it. And um, offering advice and, you know, and, and being there. And so we have a way that we're called as Christians to live out our faith. How do we do that? Where do we go with that? What does the Bible have to say of that? And there's a few ways that James points out specifically how we're to live out our faith. And we're going to go down a little bit through the book of James, uh, the second chapter. And the first one is showing no partiality. The love of God's for everybody. All right. This is a bold statement, but I'm going to back it up with a clarifying point that I've used before. Everybody is welcome to meet with God, right? Everybody. Read through the Bible front to back. Everybody has a right to know who God is. Everybody has a right to step through the doors of a church. All right? I always get a kick out of the people that say, oh, I can't go to church. There'd be lightning coming down if I stepped in there. I'm like, number one, don't think so much of yourself. Okay? If and number two, reread your Bible. There are, pe- there are people in the Bible that have done way more than a lot of people have, and yet God chose to use them, and God showed mercy on them, and God has, a, has, shown a, has uh, formed a relationship with them. So it shows no partiality. Now, now, by anybody coming in the door, by anybody being a part of this and everything, it, it, it's, it's one of those things that, yes, everybody's welcome. Everybody is has a right, has a, has, a, has a gift to know who God is. But as Christians, we also know that there's a big difference between loving people. We love people. We're called to love people. It doesn't matter who they are, where they come from, what they've done, all of these things. But there's a difference between love and affirm, okay? Affirming means I love you because God loves you and we're called to love, but I can't affirm what you're in, the lifestyle you're leading, all of these sort of things. And that's where the Holy Spirit steps in. And when there's something that needs to happen, the Holy Spirit gets a hold of somebody's heart and causes that change in a person's life. So we show no partiality. James begins by addressing the issue of showing favoritism and partiality within the church. He cautions against treating people differently based on their appearance or social status. Again, if you've stuck around in church long enough, you've seen this happen. This is just 
part of the church, you know, capital C, not just Radiant or, or the church on the other side of town. This is a problem with the church. We show partiality. We tend to congregate with people that are like-minded, social classes, all of those sort of things. We, we've seen it years ago in this church here. We had a, a people leave the church that said, there's nobody in our social class, so we're leaving. And it was like, well, all right. <laughs> and, and while you're doing it, just go ahead and reread the scriptures. You know, we're all called to be the part of the body of Christ. We're all, nobody looks at each other differently. We're, we don't show partiality. We're all children of God here. And God loves us. And so James reminds us that God shows no favoritism. We're called to love our neighbors as ourselves. James chapter 2, 1 through 7. Again, it's a lot of text. So I didn't want to put it in size 5 font on the screen. It doesn't work out. He says, my brothers and sisters, believe in our glorious Lord Jesus Christ must not show favoritism. Suppose a man comes into your meeting wearing a gold ring and fine clothes and a poor man in filthy old clothes and comes in. If you show special attention to the man wearing uh, fine clothes and say, here's a good seat for you, but say to the poor man, you stand there or sit on the floor by my feet. Have you not discriminated against your young yourselves and become judges with evil thoughts? Listen, my dear brothers and sisters, has not God chosen those who are poor in the eyes of the Lord to the, of the world to be rich in faith and to inherit the kingdom he promised those who love him? But you have dishonored the poor. It is, is it not the rich who are exploiting you? Are they not the ones who are dragging you into court? Are they not the ones who are blaspheming the noble name of him to whom you belong? So do we don't show partiality. James, as I said last week, I've heard said before, it's the blueprint for how a church should run, all right? And so, showing no favoritism. We're all in this together. <clears throat> There's a great unifier across all social classes, all political spectrums, all of those things, and it's pain. We've all been in hurt. We've all been hurt. We've all been down at some point. And that's a unifying thing saying, I've been there. My story may look different than your story, but I can relate to you. And we help each other out. We're there for one another. It doesn't matter who we are, where we've come from. We can speak into each other. We can pray for one another. We can encourage one another. The other point that James makes in this chapter is that there's a thing about faith and works. James emphasizes the inseparable connection between faith and works. That if you're, you are a person of faith, you have to work, you should work to show it. He argues that faith without corresponding actions is dead. Or our faith should be evident through our actions. It, it's reminiscent of Corinthians where Paul says, "Go um, uh, therefore, whether you eat or drink or whatever you do, do it for the glory of God. And I love the old teaching by Keith Green. It was called Devotion or Devotions. It's on YouTube. But he says, so how can you play ping pong for Jesus? <laughs> you know, and, and, but he goes into a whole talk saying, even in our littlest things that we function in during the day, we can, we can show the love of Christ just by, uh, you know, as we say at the grocery store, saying a simple hello. Helping somebody out, holding the door open for somebody. Seeing somebody's having a rough day and, and, and you, if you know them and, and all that, just speaking into them saying, I've noticed this, that you're having a rough day. What can I pray with you about? Our works must be reflective of who we serve. And so he argues that faith without corresponding actions is dead. In James chapter 2, 14 through 17 and verse 26, it says, What good is it, my brothers and sisters, if someone claims they have faith but has no deeds? Can such faith save them? Suppose a brother or sister is without clothes and daily food. If one of you says to them, go in peace, keep warm and well-fed, but does not but does nothing about their physical needs, what good is it? I think the abbreviated version of that is don't use thoughts and prayers. Okay? Do something. Do something about it. In the same way, faith by itself, if it is not accompanied by action, is dead. As the body without the spirit is dead, so faith without deeds is dead. Let me just say something about this. Someone coming to you in a crisis moment, somebody coming to me with a need, someone reaching out is never going to be at a good time. It just isn't. We're busy people. We always have something to do. We always have a place that we're going. And so if we get the call or we get somebody asking us, just know it's never going to be at the right time. 
But God's saying, you still need to help them. You still need to reach out to them. Somebody comes up and says, I can't, I can't afford groceries this week. Okay? That's, this is why we have different things that we can do within the city. As the executive director at Foundations for Living and having Val there as director of operations, if you can't do something then and there, what you can do is send them over our way. It's a Christian-based organization. where They're going to leave with the food that they need. There will be needs met. And that's the beauty of the body of Christ, the hands and feet and all of those things. Because maybe you can't do something, but you can send them that way, and it, it, it helps them out in a roundabout way. There's so many different functionalities of the church. And so when somebody reaches out and says, I need help, it may be somebody that's down and out. Okay, this could be somebody that's perpetually making poor decisions and they can't get on their feet because they just, all that stuff, God's called us to help them. It could be the up and out. Okay, this is a person that is, everything's going fine and in one single moment, their world comes crashing down around them. They're fine in every other way, but they're going through a crisis mode right now. It doesn't matter if they're down and out, up and out. God's called us to help them out. <laughs> I didn't mean for that to rhyme, but it did. So if you're going to ever uh, post an Instagram post of a quote that's catchy, there it is. All right. <laughs> but it's one of those things that we it, it's never going to come at the right time, but we're called to do it. Faith and works has to go hand in hand. Number three, Abraham and Rahab are used as examples in this passage of Scripture. I love when passages of Scripture resort back to the Old Testament. James highlights the examples of Abraham and Rahab to illustrate the significance of faith in action. Abraham's faith was evident through his willingness to offer Isaac as a sacrifice. <clears throat> Again, if you're a father, you can't imagine doing that. There are days where you want to wring your kid's neck, but never take it to the point Abraham was going to do. <laughs> you know, there's moments where you're like, ah, you know. But think about Abraham and what he was going to do with Isaac. That's crazy. But his faith was as such that he was going to do it. He reminds us that mercy triumphs over judgment. Rahab, for instance, demonstrated her faith by protecting the Israelite spies. Again, another story in the Bible that throws our theological minds into a turmoil. That God would use a prostitute to, to help this story, to help this story along. I did a, I did a whole message on that once when non-Christians act more like Christians. Act more Christian than Christians do. That's what it was. Look at the story of Jonah. Jonah was a prime example of that, where non-Christians acted more Christian than Christians. Uh, maybe I'll revisit that sermon some, more, some Sunday. But Rahab demonstrated her faith by protecting the Israelites. These examples teach us that true faith springs into action, leading to righteous deeds. In James chapter 2, 21 through 25, it says, Was not our father Abraham considered righteous for what he did when he offered his son Isaac to the altar? You see that his faith and his actions were working together, and his faith was made complete by what he did. And the scripture was fulfilled that says, Abraham believed God and was credited to him as righteousness. And he was called God, he was called God's friend. You see that a person is considered righteous by what they do and not by faith alone. In the same way, was not even Rahab the prostitute considered righteous for what she did when she gave lodging to the spies and sent them on in a different direction. So we have to have Faith that leads to works, and looking at it as an example, is Abraham and Rahab. And point number four is the law and liberty. James speaks about the royal law of loving our neighbors as ourselves. There's no conditions to that. There's no what ifs. It doesn't matter if, if your neighbor helps you out all the time, so you help them all out, out all the time, or if your neighbor gives you a hard time. And neighbor doesn't necessarily mean going out your front door and going to the person to the left or to the right and saying, you're my neighbor. Won't you be my neighbor? You know, those sort of things. It's really the people that you are seeing day to day. To love our neighbor as ourself. He reminds us that mercy triumphs over judgment. Our actions should reflect the love, compassion, and grace that we've received from God. 
In James chapter 2, verses 8 through 13, it says, If you really keep the royal law found in Scripture, love your neighbor as yourself, you are doing right. But if you show favoritism, you sin and are convicted by the law as lawbreakers. For whoever keeps the whole law and yet stumbles at just one point is guilty of breaking all of it. For he who said you shall not commit adultery also said you shall not murder. If you do not commit adultery but do commit murder, you have become a lawbreaker. Speak and act as those who are going to be judged by the law and that gives freedom because judgment without mercy will be shown to anyone who has not been merciful. Mercy triumphs over judgment. There's a lot of people in society that through news stories, through media, and all of that stuff, it almost seems like we're preconditioned to not like. It could be different races. It could be different people. It could be different political affiliations, all of that stuff. That you hear so much about it that you're just like, yeah, I just, for some reason, I don't care for that person or that crowd or whatever the case is. What's being taught here is that Jesus is saying, is, is, is what Paul's teachings here is that Jesus is saying, forget all that. All of those preconceived notions, all of those troubles, all of those, those thoughts, put them off to the side. It's a person. It's a person that needs God. And we look at a lot of things that are going around in society today, the protests and, and other things that are just openly, blatantly against God. And our first mind goes, our, our first thought can go sometimes to the thought of, well, you know, you think ill of that person. But what it should go to is, number one, I need to pray for them. We need to pray for them. And they are so deceived. They're being deceived by the enemy. Satan has a grip on their lives. And it's not necessarily them that's speaking. It's Satan speaking through them. And that's what's coming out, this evil, this hatred, this the, it's exuding. And you're like, what else can it be? It's, it's evil. And evil comes from Satan. And so, you know, and God say, and, and what Paul's saying here is still teaching Jesus' command, love your neighbor as yourself. See what happens if you turn the tables. When I was in Milwaukee, when I grew up in Milwaukee, obviously one of the big names that came out during my early 20s was Marilyn Manson. All right? Brian Warner, all right? He attended a youth ministry up in Minneapolis. And the youth pastor became one of the professors at North Central University, one of the Assembly of God colleges. And what was interesting about this is there were the pockets of churches that when Marilyn Manson would come to the Riverside Theater downtown on Wisconsin Avenue and stuff, there'd be lines of people and there'd be lines of protesters as well. And then there was a pocket of two or three churches that would show up because people would, it's general seating, so you want to get in and get a good seat, you know, if that's what they wanted to do. But there'd be pockets of churches that would show up as well with tables full of snacks and water and gospel tracts and someone just not not doing the bullhorn thing, you know, you know all, of that, all of that, but just going through, handing out water, saying Jesus loves you, God loves you, all of this stuff, showing the love of Christ in a tangible way. And I think that was pretty effective. I think that's a pretty good thing. There's another uh, well-known uh, band member. His name's uh, Brian Welch. They call him Head. And he got saved. He's the, uh, the bass player for Korn. And what he does is Korn still travels. Actually, Fieldy, the, other, the guitarist from the group, he got saved. And what these guys do is before their show, they walk around the arena and, and pray for people. And Corn has changed their style and lyric, you know, they, they've ditched some stuff and all of that. But it's interesting that despite who people are, they're living out their testimony. And I think, and I know that's what Paul's pointing out here in the book of James. This is how we live. Faith without works is dead, and you need to show it in order to reflect the love of God in our lives. So going back to this video that I want to show you, it's, it's not the normal way I would end a message, um, but it's, and it's, it's about seven minutes long because he shows off some, he does some cool instrumental stuff. But listen to the words of it. If you've never met Phil Keggy before, he's about 5'4", and uh, um, has a Paul McCartney voice, and he loves Jesus with everything in him. 
And it, it just a, a fantastic, when this song came out, um, it came out originally in the 90s and had that heavy CCM sound to it. He breaks it down into this now. And, uh, but I just want you to hear the lyrics as it really goes, uh, goes along with this and just meditate on the words and what's spoken. After that, I'll come up and then we'll uh, have the worship team and ushers come up. So let's watch this. Something to shoot for on your acoustic, Dave. <laughs> I, yeah, all right. <clears throat> Report back to us. <laughs> it's I love that song. I just remember seeing them do that concert many times. But true believers stand on every word you say. And it really comes down to that. You know, James concludes his teaching on faith and works, and he leaves us with a crucial message that true belief results in transformed lives, which leads to actions. So that's where we're going to hang our hat on James chapter 2. Are we acting in the same way we're living? Or is there a disconnect there when we leave here? Or is the way we live not connecting with how we're saying we live? Okay, the actions need to match up with them. Amen? I promise you, out of all the evangelism, all the outreaches, everything a church does, the most effective form of evangelism and spreading the gospel is this passage of scripture right here. Live what you believe so people see it and they're going to be interested in it. 